On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the next Starship launch dates are revealed through FCC filings, NASA picks Blue Origin's lander for Artemis 5, and a new startup plans to map the entire world with spaceborne LiDAR. This is the Space Race. SpaceX is sprinting to prepare for the next launch of their Starship prototype heavy lift rocket. Construction work is proceeding at a blistering pace. Pieces of the new water-cooled plate and deluge system has been spotted arriving at Starbase. An ex-NASA manager was hired to help COO Gwyn Shotwell run the Starship program, and an FCC filing seems to be revealing the intended window for the next test launches. So let's start with the filing. On May 17th, it was reported that SpaceX had applied for a permit with the Federal Communications Commission for the use of certain communications frequencies. This is a normal bit of paperwork that large aerospace companies have to do from time to time, as certain frequencies are reserved specifically for operations like rocket launches. The reason this filing gets any notice is that SpaceX had to mark the reason for the request, which in this case is... Starship Test Flight 2, and the associated recovery operations. SpaceX cannot commit to a launch without FCC approval for use of those frequencies, but they also wouldn't be applying if they didn't think they were within a month or two of a potential launch. And if we take a look at the date range for this application, it covers the use of these frequencies from June 15th until December 15th. Now, that is a pretty big chunk of time for anyone to be getting excited over, but the start date is the important part. Applying for June means SpaceX thinks there's a possibility of a launch as soon as next month, and they didn't want something like communications paperwork to slow them down. Because what will be really slowing them down is the investigation from the Federal Aviation Administration. Anytime an airborne vehicle has a mishap, the FAA is forced to investigate, and Starship's April 20th explosion counts as a mishap. But while the investigation might be a normal part of rocketry, it still takes time to complete, even for the most routine examples. The problem is that with Starship's flight termination system not working properly, and a lawsuit from local environmental groups, this particular investigation will undoubtedly have some very specific conditions for SpaceX to fulfill before they are allowed a second launch. And it certainly looks like SpaceX is trying to get ahead of those. With regards to the flight termination system specifically, CEO Elon Musk mentioned just after the launch that the company would need to address that specific issue. You can't launch something as powerful as Starship without having the ability to destroy it with the press of a button. And last week, we caught our first glimpses of SpaceX seemingly testing out FTS charges on an older booster at the Massey test site in Texas, so the team is already getting to work on redesigning that system. Meanwhile, over at the battered launch site, construction crews were seen ramming new holes for concrete pilings, basically long column-like structural pieces that disperse the load forces on a building deeper into the ground than traditional foundations can. This is a very smart move by SpaceX engineers. The most likely reason for the pad's spectacular destruction during the test flight was that the sandy ground underneath the pad compressed under the power of Super Heavy's liftoff thrust. Pilings will help direct a large amount of that energy into the bedrock instead. This is also being done because parts for the new water deluge system were spotted on site. This is the water-cooled steel plate system that Elon mentioned earlier in the month as a viable way to divert a lot of that engine power without flame diverters. Some very clever folks in the community have already made a good attempt to reverse engineer these sightings, but essentially these panels will be fitted under the orbital launch mount and shoot water upwards at angles that will ensure the engines won't get wet. The water deluge will break up the pressure waves, cutting down on dangerous levels of noise, as well as the pressure wave of liftoff itself, all while cooling the steel pad enough to avoid melting the thing. This is all being done while SpaceX subtly unveiled their new Raptor V3 engine, testing of Starship 25 started on the spare test stand, and ex-NASA manager Kathy Luters is hired to help run Starbase operations. Luters used to run NASA's human spaceflight program, but more specifically, she is a big part of the reason NASA has transitioned towards using more commercial partnerships to get their missions done in the first place. The largest part of her tenure as a NASA chief was spent building up the administration's commercial programs. In fact, 
she was the person who selected SpaceX to supply the first human landing system for Artemis III. Luders has been with NASA for 30 years, and after retiring in 2021, has just recently announced that she will join the company as its human spaceflight chief. That's a lot of pieces to put together, but the big thing to note is how quickly SpaceX is moving here. They apply for a license that begins in June, while blitzing through a bunch of complicated engineering tasks and launch facility repairs, and then they hire one of NASA's best to run their human spaceflight program. Regardless of the hurdles in their way, SpaceX obviously thinks it won't take them long to be cleared. On May 19th, NASA announced that they had awarded Blue Origins lander the Blue Moon the contract for putting astronauts on the lunar surface, making Blue Moon the second certified lander for NASA's human landing system alongside the SpaceX Starship lander, which had won the first HLS contract back in 2020. The current plan is for Blue Moon to service the Artemis V mission in 2029. The crew will fly to the Lunar Gateway Station on board an Orion capsule, while the Blue Moon will rendezvous with the station shortly afterwards, having been launched by Blue Origins' as yet unfinished heavy lift rocket, the New Glenn. The Gateway Station allows for this sort of flexibility, which should make the Artemis V mission easier in comparison with the Artemis III mission, where the plan will be for NASA's Orion to dock with SpaceX's Starship lander in lunar orbit, since the Gateway Station isn't expected to be operational at that point. The Blue Moon itself is a solid choice for a lander. Its design has been worked on consistently since the first HLS competition in 2020, and includes work by engineering teams from aerospace giants like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Draper, and Astrobotic. Blue Moon has gone through some design changes since 2020, so there's not a lot of information available on it at this moment. But we do know that unlike Starship, Blue Moon's crew cabin is placed at the bottom of the vehicle under the fuel tanks, allowing for a much easier time exiting and entering, and since it was designed by a team of companies rather than just one, it makes use of as many universal fittings as possible, so it should be able to dock with any crew-rated craft in space right now. This is a legacy of the original HLS competition. That event was won by SpaceX, but the point was to allow NASA to be able to get a good look at the field of aerospace engineers and see who could design them the best landers. By now, we are all familiar with NASA's habit of designing for redundancy. So what if Starship isn't ready for Artemis 3? That was an outlandish idea until Starship exploded on April 20th, taking a gigantic chunk out of their launch pad and getting the FAA sued. So with Blue Moon, NASA gains a second, well-funded landing vehicle made by veteran aerospace designers that operates in an entirely different way than Starship. Any shortfalls of either vehicle's design should be covered by the other. If Starship needs more time to dial in its power, Blue Moon should be ready to go relatively quickly. If Blue Moon ends up being too weak or can't carry the right amount of fuel, then NASA always has Starship, so it's a good system. The only real disappointment with this is that it would have been a better choice to go with a different company than Blue Origin. The team led by Northrop Grumman and Dynetics created a really sturdy looking design that made it to the finals of the 2020 HLS competition, but that's not NASA's fault. The Dynetics lander was the smallest of the three finalists and was designed slightly overweight for the safety margins. NASA also believed that some of the tech used in the Dynetics vehicle wasn't tested enough, which could slow down development. None of those are unsolvable issues, but the other two finalists had the money to support a more complete development, so that's what NASA chose to go with. The human landing system is about ensuring NASA has the tools it needs to get their astronauts back on the moon, and Blue Origin can help accomplish that. Fuel the content you love with the Tesla Space and Space Race store. The store will be live on Sunday, May 28th, but here's how you can get exclusive early access and discount codes. All you've got to do is visit shop.theteslaspace.com or click the link in the description and sign up with your email. On Saturday, May 27th, you'll receive an email with your one-time discount code and a password to access the site before everyone else. So, don't miss out, head over to shop.theteslaspace.com now to reserve your spot. Geomapping startup NewView has developed a new technology that allows them to map the surface of the Earth using low-flying satellites armed with LiDAR, and they plan to map the whole planet this way. 
Light detection and ranging is a method of imaging using lasers. The devices shoot some quick light pulses and a receiver records the reflection. From the information gathered, LiDAR imaging algorithms can make detailed maps, including moving objects. The detail on LiDAR maps is incredible, with the algorithms able to pick out objects from large-scale buildings all the way down to individual power lines. LiDAR is normally done with flying vehicles, drones, planes, even balloons, which is why less than 5% of the world has been mapped with LiDAR. At those ranges, it takes a while to cover an area, and no one has been able to get LiDAR to work at greater distances for the same reason laser communications can be shaky. Lasers are easily disrupted by things like clouds, dust, and changes in air pressure. But, just like with laser communications, new methods and technology have made LiDAR more stable at greater distances, and NewView has a plan to use a constellation of low-flying satellites to map at huge distances, which makes covering larger areas of land much easier. The company is well-funded, with $1.2 billion in early adopter partnerships, as well as some fundraisers on the horizon. The current plan is to have a small batch of 20 satellites ready to launch in about 24 to 36 months from now, in batches of 5 units at a time. NewView is one of several new space startups who are taking advantage of new tech to do something previously unheard of. Mapping the world in 3D is just one benefit of LiDAR. The information gathered during the process could help with anything from geo-surveying to traffic design. Who knows? If this works, maybe NewView's maps will become the standard. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.